we're back. Welcome to part two of Call of Cthulhu, Alone Against the Flames. Where we last left off, our intrepid investigator, Bert Derringer, private investigator, was stranded and left in a small seaside town where things were rather strange. At first, Bert was just traveling around the town trying to get his bearings and figure out what was going on around him. Um, there was talk of a festival that was coming and uh, a festival of the flames. Bert was followed by a shadowy figure and he tried to keep up with him and chased this figure to in the darkness to the seaside cliff where it looked like the creature or person disappeared over the side. Bert was unable to find the man, but he did find a set of steps that were carved into the to the side of the cliff. Maybe we'll investigate that later, but um, having no ride on his journey back to on his way to Arkham, his new job and future, he is forced to stay another day in this town. Uh, he starts looking around and he finds this this rocky face where this this figure beckons him inside, and that's where we left off. With weary steps, you squeeze between the rocky outcrops and enter the concealed chamber, almost banging your head on the low ceiling. The man settles back against the wall and watches you draw close. Then he slides back his hood. Make a sanity roll. Ninety-six. Bert loses one sanity at the sight of whatever is revealed. Some of the man's face remains. A strip from the side of his jaw to his right eye socket is healthy and pale, if aged, but the left side is consumed by angry scar tissue. One eye droops, hooded by melted flesh, and the nostril on that side is pulled open to leave a gaping hole. The disfigured man studies your reaction with his one good eye. Name's Argabast. Willard Argabast. Guess I don't need to ask what brings you to Emberhead. Well, I was stranded here. That swollen mouth gives a little twisted, little twist downwards. Son of a devil's got rat's blood. His fingers tighten into a fist. Argobast fixes you with a lopsided yet intense stare. You seek me out, eh? He looks up at the cave ceiling. Which one of them told you about me? Never mind. It don't matter. Truth is, they fear what I know. They've never come at me direct don't want to end up like old Argabast. He giggles. <laughs> the high-pitched sound is all the more grotesque coming from the bloated lips. Then, abruptly, his gaze turns to iron. Imberhead died 40 years ago, shattered by flame, consumed by the stars themselves. The ancient hill was cleansed by inferno, and from the blackened ground came new life, as is the way of all things. The Abenaki knew. Arbogast wipes his nose on his sleeve. Except none of that happened. The flames were turned away. 
the necessary death postponed a year, and a year again, and now those up there. He stabs a scrawny finger at the ceiling, think themselves saviors of the village, think they can defy the great old ones. I, Kathuga. He shakes his head, with a straight with strange eye, eons their lives matter less than the blink of an eye. A fierce intelligence burns into his gaze, but you suspect Arbogast may co be quite insane. Should his mood change, it would not be difficult for him to seize one of those loose rocks and crack your skull with it. Um, I think I'm going to ask him about what the Abenaki, what is that word, Abenaki, what does it mean? The Abenaki, he frowns, they knew this land and cherished it. They lived here in harmony for their allotted time. Earth and air, water and fire, they accepted every daybreak as a gift, and they trod, tread lightly on the land, yet we came and we ended them. Their time is past, and now ours, too, must end. Arbogast runs a hand through his hair. A wide strip is missing on the left side, displaced by scar tissue. He climbs to his feet. Arbogast pauses in the shadows. There's something about you. Something like the previous ones never had. Perhaps you can make it through. If you want to hear more, meet me again after dark, nine o'clock, the graveyard on the other side. He lifts a gnarled finger. Don't be followed, else I won't be there. This ain't the time of year for a showdown. Arbogast wipes his nose on a sleeve again. Go now. Their eyes are on me. And stranger... Don't try to run. You'll never make it. You emerge into the sunlight, blinking and a little bit more than shaken. You've discovered a secret. Later tonight, you will choose a chance to follow up on this appointment. And at that point, you want to meet with Arbogast again. Okay. Well, I probably will, because that's really curious. I wonder what's going on there. <laughs> You turn your back to the road and your core business, getting out of Emberhead and onwards to Ossipi. The ridge gives you a good viewpoint from which you can see the course of the road. It winds with the hills, disappearing into the woodland for a while before emerging further on. You lose sight of it somewhere towards a second patch of woodland. By your best estimation, that is at least six or seven miles distance. You see no other settlements or traffic. It may be worth taking a chance in walking. The weather's still mild, but you'll need supplies before you attempt it. Your morning exertions have left you hungry. You roam the streets of Emberhead looking for sustenance. There's nothing resembling the busy cafes of your hometown or anything that might be called a restaurant. It's beginning to look like you will have to get supplies from the general store when May Ledbetter comes down the street with the girl trailing in her wake. This must be Ruth. As she notices you, you she races past her mother and approaches you with a smile. This is a different Ruth from the shy creature of last night. As she reaches you, she stops and stretches her arms up in celebration. She looks up into your eyes abruptly. The smile drops from her face and she looks several years older. Get out before the festival! Get out! She blinks hard and then scuttles back towards her mother. May approaches, wrapping an arm around her daughter's shoulders. She smiles. How are you getting on? Have you found a transport? Startled, you explain the frustrations of the situation. I tried Mr. Winters in the hall, village hall. He's always in the, in the afternoon. You'll be hungry by now. Help yourself to any food in the house. The door's not locked. 
You glance at Ruth where she has squirreled behind her mother's leg. Her eyes implore you to silence. You take your leave of the Ledbetters and head towards their house. The door opens easily. In the low kitchen, you make a meal from stodgy bread and leftover stew. A little window offers a view into the mountains. If you learned one thing this morning, it was that Emberhead streets hold little to occupy the visitor from out of town, but there's still about five hours of daylight remaining. You could take some provisions and the bare essentials from your luggage and set out in the hopes of reaching another settlement before dark, or you could ask the advice of this Mr. Winters. I think... I think Winters is the way to go. The village hall overlooks the lower north ridge of the village. You walk along Silbury Street to find it, conscious of the oppressive black metal structure framed at the end of the road. The shutters of the hall are opened and some windows left ajar. There is no knocker, but a little bell over the entrance tingles tinkles as you push the door. Inside a sturdy Inside a sturdy door to your right is marked private. To your left, an opening leads through the bright room. You take a few steps inside. Benches line the walls and there are two notice boards mounted between the windows. I'm gonna check out that notice board. The floorboards creak beneath you as you cross the room. You feel a slight spring in your step. Perhaps this room is used as a gymnasium for the village children. One notice board appears to be for the adults of the community and the other for the children. The former looks neglected, featuring handwritten advertisements for household items and a yellowed note about telegraph pricing. There's nothing about the festival. The children's notice board has a schedule for weekly crochet services and a number of painting paintings obviously done by the children themselves. Most are incoherent, though colorful. As best you can tell, they depict fireworks, or perhaps the tale of Joseph from the book of Genesis. One has lost a pen and hangs upside down. It shows a giant bird attacking Emberhead, or it might be simply that the artist has not yet mastered the subtleties of scale. Let's make a spot hidden check. 41. Well, I definitely succeed. That is a that is a a normal success. At the afternoon sun hits the floor, you notice something curious. The boards under the windows are newer than the boards in the center of the floor. The frame also shows signs of having been replaced in the recent past. Perhaps rain leaked in and rotted the wood. The door scrapes behind you. A middle-aged, bespeckled gentleman appears in the doorway. May I help you? You explain you're visiting on May Ledbetter's recommendation. Ah, well, I'm Clyde Winters, but I'm not sure I can help you. Would you care for some coffee? I'm partial to a cup in the afternoon. He gestures to the open door behind him. This seems like a worthwhile opportunity, and you are a little thirsty. You step through the door marked private. The other side of the village hall is marked contrast to the public space. The room is compact, lined with shelves of books and file alcoves. One corner is reserved for a tiny pantry and what is presumably a water closet. You study Mr. Winters as he fills the percolator. Although thin on top, his hair is oiled and neatly swept back. His suit, a sober affair, and well-tailored even if the cut is a little old-fashioned. A lesser man working alone might have loosened a bow tie for comfort. On the desk, opposite the wall, you notice what looks like a telegraph set. I'm going to check on about that telegraph set. Maybe I can send a message to someone. The telegraph. Hmm. Hmm. Much as we value our isolation, we do need the link sometimes. You were hoping to send a message? I'm a 
must apologize. The line has been down for two weeks. I reported the fault, but, of course, they're not so speedy when the problem lies in a rural area. I'm expecting a repair the day after next. I do appreciate how frustrating this must be. The coach is due in, what, three days? But I think he's going west. Perhaps you might engage a wagon. One of the farmers might... You explain that you've asked for a few of the residents already, but to no avail. I'll tell you what. Winters pours you a steaming, a steaming cup of coffee. The dark liquid smells rich and strong. When the repair crew arrive, I'll ask them to take you back with them. How would that be? They might want a dollar or two to grease the wheels. The day after tomorrow? It's less than ideal, but it's the first real opportunity you've had. I think I'll ask about the library. You make a small but flattering remark about a couple of the volumes on a shelf. Winters blushes with pleasure. Well, of course, they're not my personal collection. They, they belong to the village. But I did select most of the recent items. This is the community's library, you see. I put up the private sign to stop people just wandering in and meeting in the other room, but this is really public space. You scan the shelves. There's a sparse but respectable collection on mathematics and the sciences, passable sections on history and art, and a shelf of literature. He has a few lowbrow novels tucked away in the corner with tatty copies of Bizarre Tale magazine. Quality does not always equate to popularity, I'm afraid. Winters gives you an apologetic smile. I think I'll research in the library for a little while. Winters is happy for you to spend the rest of the afternoon in study and offers you an upright but comfortable chair. You have a you have enough time to peruse one line of research in, de in depth. Um, I could research the history of the area, the festival. I could read something about the sciences or read some of the weird fiction. I am curious about the festival, so I'm going to read about that. You're not surprised to find there is no published work on the Ember Heads Festival. Winters pokes around and finds a cased monogram, monograph handwritten on yellowing paper by Dr. Annie Lowowski. An acquaintance of my father's, I believe, Winters says. The manuscript is somewhat difficult to read, and you make slow progress. Annie, Ola Annie Olowski speculates that the festival has its origins in pagan rites brought over by the Celtic settlers, which celebrate the ancient festivals of Beltane, Samhain, Imbolc, and Lutsanaga. There is some discussion of the struggles between the seasons and a couple of oblique references to the alignment in Emberhead. Annie Olowski suggests that the meaning of the festival slowly changed around the turn of the century. The monograph term, uh, terminates mid-sentence at the end of page 28, just as it begins to discuss the modern practices. You ask Winters if he has the missing pages. No, I'm afraid those have been misplaced, he says. Perhaps they're still in the library somewhere, but... He shrugs. Ah, I must take the time for a thorough stock take. The afternoon wears on. You've not quite finished your reading when Winters glances out the window and stands up. <clears throat> he clears his throat. Make a credit rating roll. If you succeed... Okay, well, let's... My credit rating is 28. Not spectacular. Failed. I'm afraid I have some errands to run before dark, so I must close the library for today. I do hope you will return tomorrow afternoon if you're so inclined. You leave the building with Winters, waiting as he locks up. You thank him for the coffee and the access to the library. He disappears off down an alley. You hope to be away from the village before tomorrow afternoon, but... It's good to know there is a place where you can occupy yourself. As the light fades, you return to the Ledbetter house and eat a light supper. 
May is unusually taciturn. Ruth's eyes flick to yours several times during the meal. There is an urgency there you cannot quite interpret. Afterwards, May ushers the girl into their into their room. You've been in Emberhead for barely one whole day, and you already feel confined by it, both geographically and socially. The evening seems to offer little. I think uh, I'm going to try to sneak in and talk to Ruth. In time, May returns to the kitchen and busies herself clearing up. Uh, to speak with Ruth, you'll need to get May to leave for just a short while. You help with the dishes and you try to think of some ruse. In time, an idea does come to you and you ask about Silas and his friends in the village. May narrows her eyes. He knows Troy on the other side of town, she says. Not sure I'd call them friends, more like an old feuding couple. But he'd probably spend last night at Troy's place. You ask May if she could visit Troy and ask if Silas mentioned any plans to return. May looks dubious. Right now? Yeah, I'm gonna try to, uh, I'm gonna try to persuade her. Let's see. Oh, my persuade is 10. And I fail. May frowns and shakes her head. I will be happy to go see him in the morning. I must see Ruth for now. She's been a terrible handful all day. Her bedroom door closes with a heavy clunk. The familiar sound surroundings of your guest room are becoming constrictive. The neat bed, the small wardrobe, and dressing mirror have the feeling of a prison cell about them. What are you still doing in Emberhead? Your new life is elsewhere. You lie on the bed and stare at the small crack in the ceiling. You turn over in the day's events, thinking through the little details you spotted. You're certainly weary from the elevation and the fresh air. What? Do you still feel safe here? Uh, I think I'll try to get some sleep. I'm bored and feeling confined. Your eyelids are heavy, and whatever your reservations, blackness soon takes you. You dream again of fire in the grate, a small theater of lights twinkling a tiny drama. The flames seem to consume nothing almost to hang in the air. A moment later, they are around your sleeping form, filling the room with flickering colors. Blue, yellow, red, purple. They dance on and around you. The little tongues brush your flesh. You, adrift, you drift awake in the morning light. The sun is already high, but you do not feel well rested. You find yourself preoccupied with little details of the room. The wooden grain of the door jams or a chipped handle on the wardrobe. As you swing out of bed, your stomach gives a lurch and you lean too far over, nearly tumbling to the floor. You blink for a moment. Perhaps you have an illness coming on. You get carefully to your feet. The air in the room is heavy and fragrant. You stare out the window until you feel steady enough to leave. All of my skill rolls today suffer a penalty. Mm, not great. The Ledbetter kitchen is empty. Although bread and eggs have been laid out for your breakfast, there is a note from May explaining that she has taken Ruth out for a few hours. You make a quiet circuit of the village, pausing in unobtrusive places to watch the villagers. It is rather busy for this time in the morning. Yawning locals stream back and forward along the roads, carrying bundles of split logs to the site of what you've heard referred to as the Beacon. You see two figures already up in the superstructure, arranging the wood. The festival bonfire will be most impressive, but do you intend to stay to see it? You suspect by now that something is amiss here. While the villagers are distracted, I may do some illicit investigation. Or I can simply leave town without looking back. Hmm. I could search May Ledbetter's bedroom. I could go alone to the village hall. I could take a closer look at the artisan's courtyard. I could spy on activity in the beacon. 
slip down to the east road and flee for good. I'm not ready to leave just yet. I don't want to walk. I think I'm going to go to Mate's room and just see what I can find. Despite her hospitality, you do not trust Mate Ledbetter. You return to the house quite openly. I mean, where else would you go? Inside, the dwelling is still empty. You rap on the bedroom door and wait. Silence. You ease it open. The Ledbetter bedroom is in marked contrast to your own neat space. Dirty clothes are piled about the floor. On a rough quilt lies school books and cheap novels. You notice a raggedy old doll discarded down the side by the bed. Make a spot hidden check. Ooh, 87. Spot hidden is 79. Yeah, I'm gonna fail that. Too bad. You go through the Ledbetter drawers. The only item of interest you find is a wedding photograph. May's husband was a wiry man with a square chin. Despite the formality of the pose, you can see the affection between them. You feel a pang of guilt at your intrusion. Also, May might return at any time. Hmm. It says here I could push the spot hidden. Alright, let's push it. Let's see what it is that's uh, going on with May. There's more to it than just a photograph. I'm gonna keep looking. 76. My spot hidden is 79. That is a success. You notice scrapes on the floorboards corresponding to the legs of the bed. With an effort, you slide the bed away. There is a rug spread beneath it, and beneath the rug, a trap door. You ease it open. The dark space beneath is some kind of cellar. Oh, I'm definitely going down there. The daylight barely offers enough illumination to see, but a hot lantern during daytime would be very suspicious. You squeeze beneath the floor and you glance around. Your first impression is that May keeps her junk here, for there are many boxes of different sizes piled in untidy heaps. It takes a few seconds before you realize they're all traveling trunks or suitcases. There is about 20 of them. The implication hits you hard, yet you maintain enough control to check the luggage tags. You count eight or nine different names before you stop. Scrambling back up the bedroom, you close the trap door with trembling fingers, returning the bed to its place. You feel a deepening unease about the Emberhead, about Emberhead, and this day in particular. Okay, I could... I could go alone to the village hall. I could take a closer look at the artisan's courtyard, or I can check out that beacon. I think let's check the courtyard. You approach around the back of the buildings in Emberhead's northwestern corner. By this time in the morning, you would expect activity in the artisan's courtyard, but the benches and the anvils sit deserted. Your footsteps echo off the surrounding walls. One of the workshops is shut up and padlocked. You peek through the joints, but you can see nothing inside try to crack the padlock, or I could just physically break into the locked workshop. Um, I think I'm going to try to crack the padlock. I think that's going to be the best way to go about this. I don't want to make too much noise. You examine the padlock. It's old, and not particularly secure. There are plenty of metal shavings around that could work as improvised picks, but could you really pick a lock? Yeah, I'm going to try. Actually, I think I have a lock pick skill. I do, a 55. Let's see how I do. 99. That is a critical fail. But I don't think they have critical fails in this, in this book. Not good. You step back from the door and regard it in frustration. A crunching noise distracts you and a human shadow falls on a wall nearby. Someone's approaching you. You melt away in the other direction. I think it's time to check out the beacon. The northern side of the village is bustling, and you're unlikely to remain hidden here for long. You head in the direction of the church and then move up on the east side, behind the houses. 
A drop looms on your right. One particular section of ground is quite narrow, and you have to hug the building for support. All right, well, since they're the same, we're just going to have to make a, a, a size roll. 52. I succeed. The turf sinks beneath your feet, and stone crumbles from the edge. Alarmed, you grip the building and you ease yourself forward. Finally, you have a good spot to watch the beacon. You lie concealed in the grass and watch the activity around the beacon. Villagers bring in yet more bundles of tender and stack them in neat piles. Another shift passes the bundles up to a pair of men standing on the raised platform of the beacon. They are constructing a triangular structure resembling a gigantic campfire. As you watch, you are struck by the manner of the laborers. This is their festival. You would expect a cheerful atmosphere and some light-hearted conversation, yet the faces of some of them show resignation, detachment, even naked dread. You watch for a good half an hour before you slip away. You're contemplating your next move when you see one villager, a bald man with a damaged ear, watching you intently. Some instinct in you makes you walk in the other direction. Then you see the others, ahead, and to your side. A weary teenager, an evil-eyed matron, a man hefting a club. They're not staring as obviously as the first, but they keep you under, your wa under their watch. And they're closing in. You cannot hope to overcome four of them at once. You try to lose them among the buildings, or I just run for it. Um, I think I'm just gonna run for it, like straight up, just get out of there. These people know their village better than you. You pick the biggest gap between them and you sprint into it. They give chase. You find yourself heading for the southern road. As you approach, you see four villagers stationed in the middle of the road, clearly guards. You veer off towards the half-ruined church, already breathing hard. You slip inside the building through a broken window and duck under the elderly boards that slash the interior, making for the door on the other side. The door is quite intact, moldy, and locked. Two of your pursuers climb into the church through the window. The other two enter by the main door. Give it up. One thumps his club into his palm. It'll go better for you if you don't resist. They close in. You're getting low on options. I'm gonna try to uh, collapse a part of the roof on top of their heads. Even as you spin around and look for a weak point, you know this plan is deranged. Less than two days ago, you were taking a coach ride to a new job, and now you're trying to demolish a church while standing still inside of it. Under one section of particularly collapsed roof, collapsed roof you see a wooden pillar that's already bowed. You snatch a piece of broken ironwork. Make a hard strength roll. Well, my strength is 70, so I need at least a 35 here. 87. You beat the pillar with all your strength. The villagers draw back in alarm. Then they relax and they see you're having no effect whatsoever. They back you in against the church wall. You swing your club for a few desperate seconds, but they overpower you and tear it from your fingers. The fading light from a narrow window tells you afternoon is giving way to evening. Your hands are shackled behind your back, so you cannot even lie down on the rough bed. A woman you have not seen before comes in. Her face is wrinkled and her eyes dull. They do not meet yours, but she puts a cup to your lips. I am not going to drink that. You turn your face away, and when she tries again, you dash the cup from her hands, using the side of your head. The clear liquid spills across the floor. The woman gives a half shrug and turns to leave the room. You shout after her, but she gives no reaction. You soon become thirsty. As the light fades outside, your little prison becomes dark. You can hear much activity around the building. Occasionally, an orange glow passes the window. The only comfortable position in the shackles seems to be to sit against the end of the bed with your arms hanging behind you. 
you need to concentrate and come up with a plan. There's clearly no escape from your bonds. You do not know exactly what your captors want from you, but you cannot imagine the fact that they've spent the entire city constru- the entire day constructing a massive bonfire. The door scrapes, wrenching you back into the moment. Orange light spills into the house from blazing torches held at the threshold. Two large villagers step in and grab you. At the least, you assume they're villagers. They, are, they wear heavy black cloaks and their faces and hands are painted entirely black, save only for a red triangle centered on their left eye. You try to drag your legs, but they reach under your arms and lift you bodily from the bed. Outside, it seems that the whole village has congregated to see you. Every single one has a blackened face with the red tri- triangle motif. Torches sputter and spill fire. You struggle, but you can see physical resistance is hopeless. You're marched into the center street and turned to face the beacon. The procession down the approach is slow and formal save when you sense weakness and yank at their captor at your captors a chill touches you when you see three human shapes carried ahead of you draped in red cloth the beacon looms larger and larger its dreadful silhouette a black triangle pointing to the stars a low drone begins among the cloaked figures unbidden the word mourners comes to mind smoke from their torches makes you cough (laughs) you feel the heat on your face as you reach the cleared area around the beacon three dancers break from the pack young girls swinging balls of fire in spectacular arcs drawing circles in the night air One by one, they draw close to you and touch your forehead with sooty fingers. Each kisses you three times on the left cheek, the right cheek, then the forehead. Then they whisper in your ear. The smell of kerosene fills your nostrils. Make an appearance roll. Well, I have a 50. I'm very average. 22. This might save me. If you succeed, go to ten. Through your sacrifice, the village will be reborn, says the first dancer. You pass from earth to air for all our sakes, says the second. I've weakened the chains, says the third. Don't try to escape until the flames are high enough to hide you. You stare at the third dancer. In that inky visage, you clearly discern the frightened features of Ruth Ledbetter. Their dance weaves off and disappears behind the buildings. As you arrive beneath the beacon, ten villagers close in on you. Working with surprising coordination, they immobilize you and they lift you up to the blackened iron stairs to the raised platform. You cannot help but shiver at the sight of the central framework, twisted from past blazes and what you can now clearly see to be the fastening points for a chain. None of uh, of their eyes meet yours as they lash you to the metal. The village sings now, something rhythmic and ancient, carved from old symbols. A second group ascends to the beacon, carrying the three red-draped bodies. With reverence, they arrange their burdens in a triangle around you at your feet. Then they withdraw, leaving you alone with the dread, shin deep in a sea of kindling. It seems the entire village is gathered around the beacon to watch you burn. Behind the face paint, you recognize May Ledbetter and, yes, that is Silas, the coach driver, standing at her side. The audacity and scale of the deception staggers you. A man steps up on a dais and raises his hands with quiet authority. The frame of his spectacles obscures the red triangle on his face. So, we draw here together again on this night, as we do each year, 
and we give thanks to the one who will preserve the village against the fire of the void. You will be taken by the ones from above in our stead. Your death will bring life to our streets and bounty to our fields. It will safeguard our children and our elders alike for another year. We salute you. He bows his head. All around the beacon, bearers step forward and lift their torches to the edge of the raised platform. A ring of tiny flames flicker up around the perimeter. As they wink, the singing of the villagers drops to an unearthly rhythm. I'm going to try one last time to break free. You're tired, and your flesh ought to be insufficient against the dark irons of the chains, yet you can feel it give just a little. There is weakness in one of the links. It says make a hard strength roll. I need a 35. 63. Flames snake across the kindling, catching and rising. Smoke rises and it becomes difficult to see the villagers. The three bodies surrounding you catch fire, blazing with sooty red flames. You begin to cough. <coughs> As the smoke enters your lungs, you fight down the urge to panic. Flames lick at your legs. Your eyes water. You're shrouded in smoke. It might be your imagination, but you think you can feel a slight give on the chains. You throw yourself against them, giving no thought to how they bite into your wrists. Okay, it says I, I, I take 1d6 points of damage. I take 5. Ooh, ouch. But I get to make another strength roll. 46. This is a success. I'm, I'm pulling against my chains, I'm cutting into my flesh. Desperation lends you strength, and you yank at what you guess to be a weak point on the chain. It breaks. You throw the chain off, stumbling across one of the red shrouded corpses, heading away from the watching villagers. You cough. Your hair and embers, your eyebrows smolder. Take 1d6 points of damage from the fire. I could die here. Four. I'm down to two hit points. You leap from the conflagration on the far side of the beacon. Your heart lurches momentarily at the sight of the sheer drop beneath you, but you land a few inches short of the edge. You roll to extinguish your burning clothes. Your lungs feel singed. Everything hurts. The chant of the villagers gathers in intensity. You peer around the beacon. They don't seem to have noticed your absence amidst the billowing smoke. Most of them are staring into the sky. You crawl as rapidly as you can for the cover of the nearest building. With the villagers assembled at the beacon, the streets are empty and you are able to pad away from the blaze. You must get out of town before they finish. The chanting seems to accelerate as you round the corner of the southern road. Here, parked against the side of the general store, you have your first piece of luck since reaching Emberhead, a bicycle. You learn to ride one of these in Providence. You settle into the saddle. Your burned flesh protests at the contact. I'm going to try to ride out of town. i got to get out of here. It takes a moment to recapture the skill of riding the bicycle, but after the first turn to the east, there is a long downhill out of Emberhead. You hear screams and cackles above you, but concentrate on balancing and working the pedals in your weakened state. You've had too many hopes dashed in this abomination of a village. You keep your head down, and you ride away. Twenty minutes later, with... No signs of pursuit, you stop for a breather at the top of a hill. You can see Emberhead rise in the distance. The entire village appears to be ablaze. The dark column of smoke above it will be visible for many miles, but if the village is as isolated as it seems, help is unlikely to arrive in time. You watch the place burn for five minutes, and then you mount the bicycle again and ride towards civilization. And on. The end. 
okay, I like it. I feel like there's a whole lot left in this adventure that I didn't uncover. Um, and maybe I'll play through it offline to, to close that off. But that, wow, that was pretty fun. I like the idea of, of uncovering a little bit of a mystery with you guys in, in a, in a solo scenario. Um, it's, less engaging than I think than the D&D solo plays because you're watching me create the story as we go but I think there is also a place for this kind of uh, content as well um, I've got a, a few other solo adventures that aren't designed around um, being educational uh, and instructive in their nature they're uh they're a lot more narrative focused and a lot more lethal and I think I will continue playing Bert in them in the uh, in the coming weeks, you know, we're, we're going to be alternating between uh, OSC, AD&D, Call of Cthulhu, and maybe some more adventures as well. I, I, I want to play as many different kinds of games as we can. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy this kind of content. Maybe you like the new mic. It, uh, it adds a little bit of uh, ASMR. <laughs> style to the to the read through so hopefully you enjoyed that also i didn't show the dice this time um i figured maybe you want to see my face instead of just my hands if you prefer the hands let me know or or we can do the face uh it's it's up to you guys i think it's it's really like what you're more interested in seeing and, and what you're willing to watch so uh thanks for watching and i'll catch you in the next one Bye bye